everybody from uh, the West Coast down on the beach in California. It's uh, your intraday, exactly midday, 9.45 a.m. Pacific time, uh, live online webinar with myself and Dr. K. Dr. K, you're there from London? Live from London in the evening hours, eight hours ahead. That's right, 5.45 p.m. So uh, just want to make sure everybody can hear us just fine. Shoot us a yes, please, if you can hear everything fine. All right, very good. Uh, I want to have a little bit of fun before we get started. And what I'm going to do is I've got two Virtue of Selfish Investing t-shirts. For the first two people who can answer the following question. Now, most of you know, I just want to make sure everybody ready. Everybody ready out there? Okay. This webinar will be recorded. Uh, everybody is back as we like to say, on the desk. Bill uh, Griffith, our trader and operations manager, was out at his farm in Chavita, New Mexico, but he's back at his station up in the Bay Area. I'm uh, here on the beach in uh, L.A., and Dr. K is back in his station in London after a little weekend madness in Varna, Bulgaria. So we're all here, so we have all the technology we need to record the webcast and put it up on the website once we have it ready to go. So. Everybody ready? Here's a question. And the first two people to answer this question correctly are going to have a Virtue of Selfish Investing t-shirt sent out to them via FedEx. So everybody get ready here. Here's the question. Uh, you probably all know that I've worked for several brokerage firms, broker-dealers, NYC member firms, uh, through by 20 years plus uh, in the business. Okay. Now I have something in common in this regard with one of the world's greatest traders, Jesse Livermore. So the question is, what brokerage firm have both I, Gil Morales, and Jesse Livermore worked for? All right, we've got our winners here. Uh, I'd like Michael Zuckerman is our winner. And Ron Ramsey is our second winner. I'd like you guys to email me your address and phone number so we can FedEx off a t-shirt to you. Also, tell us which size uh, you'd like. We have uh, large and extra large, and I think we even have XXL for you fatties out there. And uh, I confess, I wear an XXL. I like loose t-shirts. That's my basic trading uniform. Anyways, congratulations to our winners again. Michael Zuckerman and Ron Ransom. Wasn't that fun? Okay, now if you can trade that for what's behind door number two. No, I'm just kidding. Um, anyways, let's get to the market here. So what's going on today? You know, from my perspective, and I'll let Dr. K chime in in a second here, but I'm looking at a lot of stocks, you know, on the long side, and i got to tell you, it, it kind of sucks as far as I'm concerned. You're seeing a lot of what I think is just kind of junky action in a lot of stocks. You know, there's some things acting well. Of course, everybody knows the Apple story. Uh, and of course, we get a, you, know, you know, most of this move here probably was presaging the blowout numbers. But this is a late stage base. Is this going to be the final top? Big gap up, kind of an exhaustion move here at the end of this long run. They're selling into it. Volume is very heavy on Apple today. And they're selling into it. So we'll see what happens. Uh, just a quick question for Dr. K. Is this a viable gap up, Dr. K? <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely not. Uh, it's right. And uh, it just is, there's too much risk in buying this kind of gap up pattern, especially since this base is a very late stage base. Now, that said, I will buy stocks off late, late stage bases, but if they're extended, uh, like this gap up here is, um, then I'm going to avoid it. Now, what I would do, on the other hand, is watch how Apple trades over the uh, ensuing days. And if, if it forms an island here and then breaks out of that island, you could buy it. Uh, and it, you're not paying much more than if you would buy a product today. Uh, my feeling, too. Uh, just so you know, the correct answer was Payne Weber. Jesse Livermore had a job when he was, I believe, 14, 15, 16 as a board boy for Payne Weber back in the early 1900s. I think Payne Weber was founded in 1906. It was sold a few years ago uh, to UBS Securities. And uh, in fact, the UBS office in Century City, California is the same office where my old Payne Weber 
branch was at when I worked at Payne Weber uh, up till 1997 until Bill O'Neill personally recruited me to come and work for him and manage money and run his institutional services group which as you all know was a, a memorable eight years of my life and uh, definitely a privilege and an honor but in any case the correct answer was Payne Weber so we got two t-shirts going out uh, just send us your address and phone number Michael Zuckerman and Ron Ramsey Anyway, so that's a story on Apple. But you know, you got some other stocks. VMware came out and they blew out earnings, supposedly, but they didn't really guide very well. Stock gaps up and now you're kind of reversing. So a little bit cheesy there. Now, if you like to play uh, earnings roulette, you know, you've got Riverbed here. Pocket Pivot yesterday, uh, you know, there, you could say, I mean, it was objectively a pocket pivot, but it's a little bit funky here. Uh, my tendency is not to play anything going into earnings because it's just too much of earnings roulette. I'd rather have a position ahead of time. Or if you did try to play this on the pocket pivot, hopefully you scaled your position down, you know, to five or ten percent. You know, ten percent still the stock's down some. Uh, oh gosh, thirty, forty percent, I believe, right now. Let me check this. Uh, yeah, Twenty-eight percent off its high. Yeah, so it's pretty brutal. So you know, it's earnings roulette, and this is something we've talked about consistently. Uh, in these webinars and during, particularly during earnings season. So the bottom line is, you know, it's, a lot of these stocks look poor. Here's another one, another earnings roulette loser uh, here, or Red 19 as we like to call it internally. That's kind of our job. Altera also, they came out with good numbers. It's heading for its 20-day moving average. EMC, I don't know if they came out with their numbers, but I noticed it tried to break out earlier and it's failed. Uh, Let's see here. What else? Looking. Oh, uh, Aruba Networks. You know, this is one we talked about. Here's your left shoulder head here. It's a big ugly head with a break down the right side of the head. Here's your right shoulder starting to break down through the 200 day moving average. Just starts to come into play as a short sale right here with the potential for it. If you drew a line here, you know, down to here, potential for it to come down to the neckline initially. So it found support at the 200 day, bounced up into the 50 day here, and then just rolled over today. And the volume's picking up and it's dying. So my guess is it's heading for the $20 level. The question is whether you get a rally back up to 26.55. But that's a good example of a stock in a shortable position. We haven't put it out as a short sale setup on the website yet. We wanted to talk about it on the webinar first, since this is a little bit more of an exclusive service, although we do have a number of members here, but it still is not uh, close to the total number of members we have on the regular website. So so there's one for you. I noticed Wynn also came out. It was funny to listen to the CEO of Wynn yesterday slamming the Obama administration, and, and he's right. Uh, there's just too many regulations. There's too much vacillation in decisiveness. Uh, I really think that uh, Obama is probably the worst president I've seen in my lifetime. Jimmy Carter comes in a close second, but it's not to say that Republicans are necessarily any better, because as far as I'm concerned, they're all pretty much two sides of the same coin. And uh, they've got us into this debt spending madness or you know, now they want to raise the debt ceiling. And yesterday we see a big rally when Obama talks about the Gang of Six. You know, they're starting to sound like '60s activists, um, like the Chicago Seven or something. But uh, supposedly there is a compromise, and we have to realize even if they come up with a compromise, okay, you're still looking at a 2.7. One number I saw: 2.7 percent baseline spending growth, even under the Ryan plan. Okay, so there's no real uh, cutting of spending at all. It, it's they're slowing, it's lowering the rate of growth in spending, and they count that as budget cutting. So we live in a twisted Orwellian world, and with the choppy market that we've seen, that has pretty much been the story. So where does that bring us? It brings us back to our standbys, which have been the precious metals, and we still are positive on the metals. You know, it's funny how. These things gap up for five days and go nuts for five days, and they pull back one day, and people wonder if we're concerned. Um, we're actually more concerned that they are asking us that we're concerned because we're really not, and what's the point anyways? We know if that, the, that if these things run up quickly, you're going to get sharp pullbacks, and it's pretty much standard for the precious metals. Silver is two to three times as volatile as gold. So if you own SLV, Guess what? It's like owning the DGP and gold actually more volatile. So you're going to have to be able to handle some volatility. But let's, let's look at our, our parameters that we're operating within here. On the first hand, we have a pocket pivot coming up through here. This qualifies as a pocket pivot 
based on the fact that gold broke out at about the same time here. So you can actually tag along uh, with gold using the SLV and then using your buy and sell signals uh, being generated by the GLD. That's a little twist. We like to operate on that basis too. Although you did have a pocket pivot seven days ago right here followed by another pocket pivot type gap up through the 50 day moving average. You're going to notice here you now have all these moving averages are turning up the 10, the 20, the 50, the 65 day exponential and the 200 day which has been going up the whole way anyways telling you that the long term trend in silver and in precious metals remains intact. That's what we know for sure right now. So today we pull back to the 10 day moving average. Volume is running uh, let's check it out here. What's our volume rate, Dr. K? Running 14% above average on the SLB, which means we could, uh, we might get close to yesterday's volume, which is about 57.8, 57.8 million. If we did and we exceeded yesterday's volume, you would have a pocket pivot buy point off of the 10 day moving average. But given that we know how silver can act, and when it gets into some upside thrust, which is what we're anticipating here, I think you can get a pretty quick. Uh, route to the the highs here at least somewhere into the lower mid 40s before you start to consolidate I'm thinking maybe halfway up here I don't know you're, you're kind of throwing darts here but it seems to me that there's enough thrust in this move to generate a move higher and you came right back down to the 10 day moving average now if you like to add on weakness then you could add at the 10 day moving average we put that out earlier this morning in an email alert so you could add if you like to add on weakness. Now, I pointed out that the portfolio simulator dude is using a different method. He came in at 36.71 on this day on the gap up pocket pivot. So I want to demonstrate that you don't have to necessarily be early here. You can take a position here and then work it using stops. And basically he's operating on the basis of this. He came in on a 25% position at 36.71. If it breaks that on the downside on a pullback, He'll sell half, and then it's got to see a violation of the 50 days to sell the other half. So that's just a way to run it on autopilot. It gives you the opportunity to be right in a big way if our thesis on the precious metals turns out to be correct. And as with, with anything, that's not always guaranteed. But we want to be in a position having bought here to uh, ride this thing up to the upside. So things are looking pretty good for silver today. We came down to the 10-day turning around. Volume is running about 14% above average at midday, and you're coming up off the 10 day moving average. So you have to use this weakness. If you like to buy on weakness, the portfolio simulator dude is going to add every 10% up. So he's waiting for it to hit 36.71 plus 3.671 points, and that gives you, I think, 40.38. So that would be his add point up here. But that's the way he's handling it. He wants to have a nice cushion and then use a 10 day as your trailing stop as it comes up. Some some may like to buy it like me. You buy it here or you buy it down here, it runs up, pulls back, you add here. Uh, <clears throat> or come in real heavy off the 10 day here, that's another way to handle it. But you gotta adjust your stops accordingly. So right now we have silver on the SLB holding around 38.54. It looks okay right now. The GLD is doing fine as well. Never ever got close. So what I consider the breakout here is 151.86. Dr. K, what do you consider the actual breakout point from your perspective on the GLD? Well, it looks like, uh, you know, first of all, you have 51.86 as the midpoint peak. So anything above that uh, is a breakout point. You could also use the absolute high of 153.61. There you go. So I'm using 151.86. Uh, as a breakout point myself, so but it never really even got close to that on this pullback. You pull back one day, now you get these little ants up here. This is the EFS file that I use on eSignal. It tells you when a stock has been up 12 out of 15 days in a row or better. And when you see that, the way we used to use it when, I, when we were at O'Neill is that you see a breakout, and a lot of times you see this after a breakout. And so the next ad point theoretically was after a pullback and then a breakout through the peak of the final day. Uh, on the upside. Okay, so when you see the ants show up, then you're looking for a pullback of a few days. Sometimes it's just a couple, three days, sometimes it's longer than that. But the idea is that when it turns and breaks out again, you could be buying it aggressively because of the initial strength on the move uh, where you have 12 out of 15 days up in a row or better. So 
this is still acting very powerfully. There's nothing wrong here. And it was interesting that overnight I saw a couple of articles talking about how the run in gold is over with. So my guess is the running gold won't be over with when you see articles telling you that it's over with. So we didn't see a lot of people telling uh, uh, anybody to sell silver and gold when silver was going nuts and gold was going nuts here on the upside. But of course we know what <clears throat> climax tops look like. And something to look at here, this is something uh, to keep in mind when you're thinking about this uh, concept of the 12 out of 15 days. You'll notice you start to see these triangles here. but the key here is here is your breakout point in silver. So I would like to see the 12 out of 15 days, those little ants, those black triangles, I want to see them show up maybe in here. And then you could be buying aggressively here. When you get too extended and these things show up, sometimes it can uh, indicate some trouble. You notice they show up here, you have a pullback of two, three days, and then boom, it really goes nuts. But when you get them like this, this is getting climactic when you start to get a string of or a cluster of these things, uh, and they're all kind of trending up, you know, it's kind of like these things are bursting to the upside, these little triangles. Uh, my kids think they look like miniature spaceships or whatever, but uh, I guess so, little Apollo command modules. But in any case, uh, you can see how there's, the, the, here it's a little less risky to be buying them on the breakout here. If you're doing it here, you know, you have the ants and then pull back and you try to buy here. This is getting climactic when you start to see them form like that. But this file is available on the website under the download section. It is a .efs, Eddie Frank Sam EFS file that is used for e-signal charts. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here on silver and gold. Everything is still a go. Uh, we think that regardless of whether you have a agreement uh, on the budget ceiling or the deficit ceiling, rather, it's not going to matter. Silver and gold aren't going up because everybody's afraid that the U.S. is going to default. The U.S. is probably not going to default. So to me, that's kind of a red herring. It's kind of a ruse. And so when that risk is perceived to have dissipated, and I think by people who aren't that smart, frankly, uh, no offense intended, if that's what you thought, but that's not the reason we think gold and silver uh, will move higher over the longer term. We still believe that fiat money printing is the order of the day, and that's going to continue. And if you raise the budget ceiling, and even if you have the radical Ryan plan, where spending growth is limited to 2.7 percent, which is not cutting spending, I'm sorry, then you still have the, the whole concept of uh, fiat money printing. And while the dollar may be subject to rallies whenever something crops up in Europe and you see rallies in the dollar whenever Portugal or Spain or Italy, uh, their insolvency start to rear their ugly heads again, you get these jerks up in the dollar. And so we would actually be looking for the dollar to roll over and we think that you may eventually see, at least I think, Dr. K, you can chime in here at any point if you feel like it, but you'll see the euro and the dollar and most fiat currencies eventually turn back to the downside altogether, and that will be correlated to a move up sharply in silver and gold. That's the theory. That's my thesis. I'm operating on that basis right now. So as long as the technicals in silver and gold show me that it's intact or the trends are intact, then I'm going to stay with that. So I'm trying to put myself in a position to capitalize on the potential big move while limiting downside by having clear stop out levels. Uh, Dr. K, what's your take on that? Uh, in terms of the dollar? In terms of currencies, do you think that, that if the euro is dropping because of sovereign uncertainties or fears in Europe, you know, Spain, Portugal, the pigs. Uh, the pig, yeah, I like to say it backwards, the skips, the skips, say that one, SGI, IPS, anyways. Uh, can we have a situation where the dollar and the euro continue lower, and then this would be associated with a steepening rise in gold and silver? Could you see that occurring? I think, I think that's been happening already. It's kind of a race to see who devalues faster. And so <laughs> the debt currencies that are dropping, you know, the pound, and uh, you've got other European You've got the pound, and then you've got European currencies that are, you know, racing to see who uh, finishes first or really last in this case. I think the Swiss franc, incidentally, is the uh, Switzerland has a, has a way of uh, separating itself from all the mess and um, having a stellar track record in maintaining their neutrality across a lot of measures. And uh, the Swiss franc is probably the strong, one of the stronger currencies that I've seen. What's the symbol for the Swiss franc? 
No, I'm not sure actually. Uh, on eSignal, it's a uh, it's a futures, uh, but I don't think we can pull it up. I tried pulling it up earlier today, and it wouldn't go. Anybody know what the uh, ETF of the Swiss franc is? If there is in fact one, I don't recall seeing it, but I've looked at the chart of the Swiss franc itself, and it's actually acting pretty well. So, so yeah, so that's kind of what we see going on. So it's a race to see who's going to devalue first. So we don't think necessarily that problems in Europe are good for the dollar. We think you get temporarily blips whenever the news comes out. You can see these moves here, and that's what we're looking at. So FXF, FXF, try that. F as in Frank. Okay, that makes sense. Two Fs. Yes, you can see the Swiss franc has just been trending higher, uh, and it probably is going to continue higher. There, there's another uh, dynamic to, to look at that tells you that the movement away from these fiat currencies is occurring and it's real and so silver and gold should continue to benefit and I don't care how many articles you see telling you that the move in gold and silver is over with don't let those scare you out of your position and I read one on my market watch uh, somebody saying sentiment is too bullish on gold and silver well yeah sure gold was up what 11 days in a row so yeah everybody's getting all excited but that's always the case and as soon as the media starts to chime in and get excited about gold and silver, which nobody was talking about silver at 35 bucks, 36 bucks when we were last week. Okay, now Monday you have gold up 11 days or 12 days or 600 minutes, I don't know, whatever it is. And the media is all a Twitter. And they called me up to be on Stuart Barney, I think it was on uh, Tuesday morning, but I was already busy yesterday on BNN. Uh, talking about Apple. And I basically took a devil's advocate side. There are things to look at on Apple that we think are negative and positive. And obviously the breakout, and I'll just kind of backtrack to Apple here. The breakout occurred on pocket pivot type volume. You had a little pullback, not heavy, heavy volume. You got some support here and then you come out. So the breakout is a breakout. So you're not going to get negative on that necessarily. What you're going to do is see how the breakout holds. And as I would tell anybody, if you own Apple and you have a low cost basis, you would hold it unless you saw a breach of this level, this breakout level. And I would say it's really a zone from about 355 up to 365. So you can highlight this whole area, and that would be your support zone. Uh, it could dip into it and then come out of it. It could reach the bottom down here closer to 355. But that's what you'd be watching. But it's interesting to note that Apple's getting sold into here. After a long run, and you have something of an abandoned baby type of uh, gap up here, an exhaustion type of gap after this long move, straight up off the bottom. So we're kind of watching this, but we're not necessarily constructive on stocks here because they kind of suck. Um, anyways, so but I had some fun with it yesterday. My feeling still is all the good news on Apple that's come out since the beginning of the year and this is all Apple has done. Now finally a couple of weeks ago analysts started getting behind Apple you know at 12, 13 times, I think 12 times next year's estimates from some of them, some of the reports I read. Uh, you know it's a cheap stock. Well it's been cheap for a long time. Why didn't they get behind it uh, earlier? But that's what's been driving it higher and I think also when you have a QE move and it is a fact that at the end of June, the Fed pumped in $76.1 billion worth of liquidity into the system at the end of June as QE2 ended, which is the most since, I believe, March 22nd, 2008, when Lehman Brothers went under and Bear Stearns was going under. Uh, that was a lot of liquidity. So I think Apple is one of those stocks that an institutional investor, and you have to remember how institutional investors think. Generally, they run a fund or a pension fund or some other money that is run according to what they call a charter. And having worked with institutional investors at O'Neill back when I ran that group uh, from 1997 to 2005, uh, I learned a lot about how institutional investors have to think. Now, you have to remember, everybody is schooled in modern portfolio theory. So you come out of Harvard or Stanford or uh, Chicago School of Economics, all you know, the guys with all those degrees and PhDs and whatnot. But the bottom line for them is getting their bonus, beating their bogey, which is the S&P index usually, sometimes the Russell 2000, sometimes some other index, depending on whether they're growth or value. But all they want to do is beat the market. If the market's down 20% and they're down 10, they're happy. They get a bonus. So that's kind of the world they live on, live in. Well, the planet they live on and the world they live in. But uh, the bottom yeah, line you. is, oh, some news on Lockheed. I could care less, actually. Uh, 
But anyways, what they need to do, because they have charters that say you're going to invest a certain way, like a lot of guys we would talk to, we'd show them our way of investing, and you know, you can be up 50 to 100% this way, we would say. And of course, we were naive enough to think that they would bite on it, but the bottom line is a lot of them would answer, if I, if I was up 100%, my board of directors would tell me that I'm taking on too much risk, and they would fire my butt. And so a lot of it is exactly that, cover your butt. So with Apple, what happens is you have a stock, arguably, as I said on BNN, the Canadian financial TV network yesterday, Apple's arguably the consumer juggernaut of the new millennium. You know, they, they've got it all going for them. And uh, it's selling at 12 times forward earnings. So to an institutional money manager, that's cheap. So he can justify, and we would call it papering their due diligence file. So, you know, you got 10 analysts saying, oh, the stock's cheap, and we got a price target at 470, and the growth rates are this, and the margins are this, and we think they're going to sell phones in China and some of the smaller asteroids between Earth and Mars, and, and everything is beautiful. And so they can paper their due diligence file, cover their butt, and they'll buy the stock. So when institutional money has to come into the market, stocks like Apple, particularly when they're selling at 12 times earnings, are likely to attract money flows. Okay, So you'll see these kind of crazy moves in these stocks, and I think that could have been a factor in getting this going, but it got some momentum, and it's a little extended here, and we'll just have to see what happens. So there's my pontification on Apple. So I do want to go over the market indexes here, if I can. Uh, all we've got here is, you notice, uh, I drew a trend line, and I did this, I think, last week when we were talking about the market. I drew a trend line across the top. So here it is. We have this trend line breakout. You pull back, undercut the 50-day moving average, and this low here. So you make a low here right at the 50-day moving average on the NASDAQ composite. You bounce, you break, you hit this declining tops trend line almost perfectly. See that? Technical analysis does work. Nobody has to think. Just draw lines. It'll bounce off of one of them somewhere. But in any case, you come up and boom, you get some volume here uh, as we're coming up. That was yesterday. It looked real nice. Today you got volume coming I mean, in. What's our volume rate running at, Dr. K, on the market? Uh, let me see here. Well, I'm, I'm not going to use this other. I mean, it's saying minus 1% right now. Is that on investors.com? Probably. Let me check the other source. Yeah, we're looking at, uh, actually it's saying um, we're up on both New York and NASDAQ. NASDAQ quite a bit, 14.4. Yeah. And uh, NYSE 1.8. So you're churning up here, and your volume is going to be higher than yesterday as of the rate around 10:13 a.m. Pacific time. So we got another three hours, roughly, to go a little less. Uh, and you're back up off of this area and uh, up into here. So I guess is this some resistance up in here, possibly? Uh, we'll see. Maybe the high of this day is your resistance now, and you're going to head lower. I don't know. I don't like stocks. I think stocks are just choppy and sloppy. And if you're going to hold something into earnings and you play earnings roulette, we have a good question. Somebody asks, how do you handle your risk going into earnings? Okay, I'm guessing that this is someone who's relatively new because those of you who have been following us for not quite the last year know that the way we look at this, it all depends on what you're willing to take on with respect to risk and reward. Sure, if you have a blowout earnings number like you do with Apple or even VMware, I guess, which lasted for a little while yesterday, I think the gap up over like 113, uh, what you're doing is you're just gauging, okay, in a worst case scenario, how far can this stock come down? Well, there's some risk in gauging a worst case scenario because sometimes you end up with something like this. And if you had bought on the pocket pivot here a 10% position and this thing is down 25%, you're down 2.5% to your portfolio. In my view, that's entirely tolerable and not uh, not really a big deal. Uh, but, you know, you have to gauge that. So if you said, I'm going to buy this, and I think that the potential downside is to this support area down here on a breakdown, on a bad earnings report, then I have to figure 10% is going to lose me 2.5% to my portfolio. If I want to be uh, less risk oriented and more risk averse than what I would do maybe 5% so if you drop 25% you're only coming off 1.25% to your total portfolio so that's the only way you can think about it there is no magic way of knowing whether the stock is going to launch 
or blow up when earnings come out. And that's basically how you handle it. You know, there's no no magic buy point uh, to find that's going to save you going into earnings if the thing blows up. Um, yeah, and take uh, extra me, care with biotechs because biotechs can lose. I've seen a lot of biotechs lose more than half their value on uh, disappointing. Yeah, on bad earnings or some sort of product news that shows something isn't really being developed as quickly as possible. So, you know, someone's asking me how much do I would I add to my position. I don't know. You could add half again or double it up here. It depends on my mood. You know, uh, maybe I, I ran it up here and and sold up here and uh, now I'm buying the whole thing back plus another twenty five percent or something. I don't know. You can add whatever you feel like. We have talked about a very simple pyramiding scheme, and it's the one that the portfolio simulator dude is using, which is you have your initial entry price at 36.71. That's where he came in. And the idea is he's going to add the same number of shares that he bought on the first buy at 36.71. He's going to add those when he's up 10% on that first position, so not until he's up to 40.38. 36.71 plus 10% is 3.67. Uh, we'll just use that. And so that would take you to 4038 if you add that to 36.71. And we sent that out in the alert earlier. That's one pyramiding scheme. So there's no amount, magic amount to add. It really depends on how much risk you are willing to take on. So that's really what it boils down to. You know, and, and, and a lot of people, they'll ask us, the people don't really understand risk in my view. You know, Jesse Livermore went broke twice, and he came back both times. Even though I got clobbered in 2009, I've never gone broke, but that's because I don't pile all my money into the stock market, and I maintain uh, plenty of reserves to uh, kick things back up if I need to. But, you know, Jesse Livermore went broke twice, and he was considered the third, well, a great the third time he went broke, uh, The third time he went broke, he never recovered from that. Right, never recovered. He's probably too old, too jaded, and I think he shot himself in the Washington Hotel. I've always remembered that from the book. I don't think his reminiscences had that, but there was a biography, and it has some pretty seedy pictures of his son being arrested uh, and all these other kind of sordid things that I didn't Yeah, it's called the amazing, the amazing Life of Jesse Livermore. It's a good book. Yeah, The Amazing Life of Jesse Livermore. It's a great book. Uh, I would read it. The end of it's kind of depressing, but it does show if you go broke twice, third time you're out of there. Uh, he couldn't recover so um, I'm lucky I've never gone broke but then I don't commit if I'm if we're handling a very risky strategy uh, and just going you know uh, whatever an anatomical part to the wall you want to put up there uh, you have to gauge your risk you know so we always say to people people say oh how much money should I invest in the stock market hey Dr. K what's a quick answer to that one how much money well, should I invest in stock? Yeah, I mean, whatever you can afford to lose, essentially. You, exactly. So, and, you know, people never get that one. It's like, oh, you know, here, take my annuity money. Um, yeah, otherwise, otherwise no. you're going to trade with too much emotion, and then emotion is going to screw up your trading, even if you've got a great trading strategy underway. Um, and right. see, on, on that book um, written about Jesse Livermore, what I found most interesting about the book was that the author dissected why uh, Jesse Livermore's trading derailed as it did in the 30s. In other words, why he couldn't come back. And essentially, he, he couldn't make the comeback because I believe one of his, one of his kids was uh, had, a death, had a death threat, and I think he was estranged from one of them, and then his wife mm -hmm. was trying to sue him. Uh, I mean, all these personal problems crept into his life, which he, which he couldn't control, and that bled into his trading. Um, and if people know, know the history of Livermore, he made over $100 million in 1930 dollars shorting the market, <laughs> uh, which is a phenomenal amount of money for 1930, and yeah, he was, of course, blamed for it uh, unfairly, um, but all this blame and the family situation really weighed on him to where he lost that huge sum of money. He actually was penniless, I think, by 1934 or 33, and uh, just couldn't make it back. And the reason he wrote, wrote that book, uh, How to Trade in Stocks, that's, that thin volume that was published, I think, in '37 or something. Um, mm -hmm. which is an excellent book for any trader. And the reason he wrote that was he was trying to trying to scrape together some money so he could start trading again. Right. So we fortunately won't ever run into that problem. But it's it does speak to one thing, and that is you guys need to think about this. If you're running however much money you have in the market and you get nervous about it, then you are really addressing 
the answer that we have for the question, how much should I put into the stock market? And our answer is unequivocally, how much can you afford to lose? Because unless you can afford to lose it all, you're always going to be afraid of losing some of it, and that's going to affect your psychology. So what, are you, what you need to do is scale down what you're working with to something that you're not going to be afraid of losing. Okay, And if that means you're not uh, willing to lose any of it, then guess what? You're playing the wrong game. And I think in that case, I'm not sure what I'd do. Remodel your home before prices start to go crazy, I guess. But that's really the bottom line. And so I would say to anybody who's on this right webinar right now or listening to the recorded version, if you can't afford to lose all of what you're running right now, then you're probably not going to be running with clean psychology. So um, anyways, that book is by Richard Smitten. Thanks, Ron, for that. Uh, shot himself at the Nederland Hotel right on Central Park. Ooh, I like to stay at the, uh, there's a couple of hotels. The Essex House used to be uh, nice, but I don't like it anymore. But that's where we usually stay. That's on uh, Central Park, I think, west. I don't know the, the, the uh, side of the park closest to the financial district in Midtown. So, yeah, Jesse was manic depressive, too. So, I myself, I'm just manic. I don't ever really get depressed. So, all right, well, let's look at some other names. LinkedIn, of course, everybody's asking about that. But we already talked about this before, and and here's the idea, is that you have the pocket pivot here, okay? So if you took a position, you probably took it somewhere around 98, 99, 96, somewhere in there, maybe even 100. But what happens is it, it runs up, and it is volatile. So what we're going to do is just use a violation of the 10-day moving average right here, the pink line. Let's make this even bigger so everybody can see it. Okay, a violation, you close below the 10-day moving average here. So what is a violation of the 10-day moving average? Well, first you have to have a close below it, and then you move below the intraday low, which I'm going to line it up there. You move below that intraday low today, you're gone. So we had a position in LinkedIn. We took it in here, and we decided we're going to try and you know, see if it works. And it's a little bit sloppy here. Maybe it needs to build a handle. So we're just out. We'll let this thing build a handle now and see if it forms out. And it's potentially, it could uh, do that. It could also break down, but you kind of let it go now because it's told you to sell it. That's all we're doing. There's nothing uh, nothing more to think about. So, and again, if this bothers you, then guess what? You've invested too much money in the stock market. Because we'll come in, we'll take a position, we'll just let it run. You know, we don't get excited here. We don't freak out here. We don't even have any thoughts or emotions about it. We just have a stock. That's all we have. So the only thing you should have about stocks is stocks and buy points, no emotions. And so we're out. And that's the end of that story. But it's also telling us that this market is not going to be kind in terms of uh, buying individual stocks in the long side. So another one that's breaking down. Okay. And uh, same thing here. We have a hard stop at 29.95. So guess what? It goes off at 29.95. Boom, we're gone. See ya. So you had a pocket pivot here, failed pocket pivot here, then you had a pocket pivot here. The stock came off of uh, the quiet period, which is I think 25 days, trading That's days, 40, something 40, like that. Uh, 40 calendar days. 40 calendar days, which in this case works out to about 25 trading days. It comes off of the quiet period. So all the investment bankers, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Goldman, et cetera, Credit Suisse, they all come out and they can now put out ratings on the stocks. So what they did is they put a neutral on it uh, on based on valuation. So the stock really doesn't go anywhere. That was yesterday, so it came off on some volume. That's what I was telling you it was having some problems. Usually if you have a pocket pivot up through the 10-day moving average like we did four days ago, once you close below the 10-day, you can use that as your selling guide for a short-term selling guide, but once it violates, and guess what, when it violated, it was just about twenty-nine ninety-five. That just happened to work out that way for us today, but that was it. We just blew the thing out. So, you know, we took a position here, a me measured position. It costs us one or two percent to our portfolio. Big deal. We've got lots of silver, and we've got lots of gold. So, we're happy with that, and those are acting well, and we'll just keep staying with that until it hits our stops there. And that may mean that we're going to be down 4 or 5% from where we started. Well, that's fine too. We can deal with that. It doesn't really bother us. Uh, for silver to have, the SLB could have a pocket pivot. I'm actually tracking that with an alert. You traded uh, 57.8 million, just a little bit more. I think it's 57.828, depending on what service you're looking at. Let's check this out. We're using e signal 57.878.107. So on that basis, uh, you would be looking for that 
Fifty-eight, uh, eight. Well, what was it again? Where Fifty-eight, eight seventy-eight, one hundred four. Yeah. So I got an alert at fifty-eight million. If it hits fifty-eight million before the close, and you have a pocket pivot. Uh, otherwise, I think it's just a nice pullback. And the thing to remember again, let's look at silver on that last run, which we played to perfection using the AGQ. But look at you break out. Whoa, hairy pullback. And I remember a lot of people were concerned here. The next day it just gaps up and keeps going higher. Pull back a little bit here. Whoa, another hairy pullback. Gap down. Look out. Coming down here, intraday, you'd be scared out. Comes back above the 10-day. Hold tight for one day. Whoa, another gap down. And this time you go to the 20-day moving average. But you hold for a couple days. Tries to scare you out. Moves higher. Ends up a little lower. But this time, everybody's probably concerned. And we probably usually get a few emails asking us whether we're concerned. But it's just another pullback in silver. Here you had a little bit tighter pullback. And you have this reversal on heavy volume. And I do remember we got a number of emails are you concerned? Well, no, that's kind of how it acts. So it goes higher. You have the 10 out of 12 out of 15 days or better here. The ants show up, pull back, hold tight, you move higher, then you climb it. So you can see, though, you get pretty good pullbacks on the way up. And so this thing is, is like what I call the bucking bronco principle on the SLV. It's trying to lose you the whole way up. You know, and, and if you're scared or you're overweighted, not handling a position that you're comfortable with psychologically with respect to the risk, that you're taking on, you're likely to get shaken out. So we scale things kind of carefully. We come in and, and we use a very simple pyramiding uh, scheme or algorithm and uh, ensures that we'll maintain a pretty healthy cushion so we can sit through any pullbacks. And you know, one, two, three percent, uh, you can hit us four or five percent even on a pullback, you're not going to scare us because we've invested in the market exactly what we can afford to lose. Okay? So you better ask yourself that question. Are you investing what you can afford to lose? Because if you aren't, then your psychology may not be so clear. So, Somebody asks us, are we afraid to buy the TBT? Are we afraid of the Fed? I don't know. To me, this is just boring. I, I'd rather just play the SLB. So if you, you want to short bonds and, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes shorting treasuries, you know, some people are mad at the government, so they feel like shorting treasuries is the way to get even. Uh, watch out for that motive. I think you just play with uh, the SLV. And I think as traders, you know, don't don't have any political opinions, even if you think uh, Obama is really blowing it, and Congress is blowing it, the Republicans are slimy, and the Democrats are slimy. It doesn't really matter. It's all just politics. It's all banter. Yeah, we're watching uh, so many cross-currents that can affect TLT and TBT. So many cross-currents, and therefore, if you're gonna if you're gonna play these instruments, you really should play them on a price basis. Um, you know, like you play futures, uh, because if you let the fundamentals get in the way of your analysis, you're you're likely to miss something or misinterpret something, and that's liable to lead to a loss. Right. Now, someone asked a good question. And that is, why did you not use a violation of the 10-day moving average on the SLV? Well, I think what you're looking at is right here. There's two things that work here. First of all, there's no violation of the 10-day of the here because this is the first day that you close below it. And guess what? You never trade below the low of this day. So the next day you actually hold right at it. The next day you hold right at it and it goes higher. So technically this never violated the 10-day moving average. But for those of you who've been following us for... Uh, not quite the last year, you know that on silver we were using the 20-day moving average on that last run coming up through 1920 uh, and we were using this 20-day moving average because it tends to show uh, that it holds it, it never really even closes below the 20-day and it didn't do that all the way up till it hit 30 and then it started to correct and then when it violated uh, that in here actually through here we just got out and then we're able to come back in again on this breakout so we were actually using the 20-day. I'm not sure right now what we're going to use yet. We could use a 20-day. For now, it looks like the 10-day uh, is a rough guide, but really the ultimate selling guide for us on the position is the 50-day moving average. Is that correct, Dr. K? Well, you can use a 50-day, but actually I would I would really use gold as your beacon because gold gold is the bellwether and silver tends to follow along gold. So if gold does yeah. something wrong, I would say let's bail out of both gold and silver. Yeah, if, if someone says, if there's a budget agreement and silver starts to pull, pulling back, would you get out for a short time? I don't know. That really depends <coughs> on where it is, but I don't think so. 
Yeah, the budget agreement. I mean, that. the budget agreement implies a, ri a hike in the debt ceiling. I suppose if it's a very small hike, and there's talk that QE3 is not going to be very effective because the amount, the dollar amount, is small, that could cause a pullback in precious metals, um, certainly, and we would yeah. be watching for that. Yeah, it would depend on whether it violates certain you know lines, but but you'll see if you just watch the portfolio simulator, the follow the stock emails that go out, that'll give you some ideas of what we're thinking. We're using that right now as a way to convey uh, our thoughts on the precious metals in real time. So if there's anything we think is significant, uh, we'll say it. So today I felt, uh, we felt that the, the SLV holding the 10-day moving average, the GLD not really doing much at all, holding well above its 10-day moving average. Those were signs that uh, everything was normal. Everything looks fine. Now somebody asked, "Do you use a 20-day moving average on the AGQ?" No, no, no. Okay, remember the AGQ and the DGP. Those are leveraged ETFs based on the SLV, which the AGQ is based on. Okay, and GLD, which the DGP is based on. So DGP is GLD, and AGQ is SLV. Okay, everybody with me there? So. What you use is we don't we don't pay attention to what AGQ is doing. We watch the SLV to tell us what to do in the AGQ. So we're keying on, you know, for so for this, yeah, this also hit the 10-day moving average, but it, sometimes there may be some variance there in their technical positions. Right now they're kind of tracking together. But what we would do is we would watch the SLV and use that to guide our decision making in the AGQ. Same thing with the GLD and the DGP. We would watch the GLD and make our decisions on the DGP here based on what the GLD is doing. So it's pretty simple, but you can see they're pretty much tracking together right now, but that's how we do it. So we don't really watch the moving averages on the DGP or the AGQ. We watch the underlying ETS, which are the SLV and the GLD. So, um, I'm not going to go into my VeriSign play back in 99. Um, just read the book on that. I talk about that, but I can't remember off the top of my head. The MDM is on a buy. The market direction model is on a buy right now. And uh, there's really uh, nothing else to think about. So, and the market's choppy, but it seems like whether the market direction model is on a buy or a sell, if it's wrong for a couple of days, it almost seems like if you wait a couple more days, it'll be right. And so it's really just a choppy environment. But I want to emphasize again, because we do, we get very few complaints, you know, maybe two or three, so I don't really want to sound like a whiner. But when somebody gets all miffed because we've had four or five signals in the last month, that's kind of the nature of the model. And I want to emphasize again that when Dr. K studied the market to come up with this model, and he also studied other market timing models. Hundreds of them, actually. Hundreds of them. He, he identified their one basic flaw, which is... Well, essentially, they, they don't have caught. any fails. They don't have a fail-safe. There's a, there's a few flaws, but the, one of the big ones is they don't have fail-safes built in, um, in many cases. Uh, in other cases, they're really good at uh, bear markets, but they lack, uh, they lack the fortitude in bull markets. Uh, a lot of them just switch in and out way too many times. Uh, people will see on our on our website that the model tends to switch 12 to 20 times a year on average. Now that's on average. On a year like 2011, which is unusually challenging because it's pretty trendless, the model is going to do more switching um, just to protect itself. So you're going to get a, a larger string of small losses, but when the new trend does emerge, and it always will, uh, then the model makes more than makes up for it. And that's always been the rhythm of the model uh, for many, many you know, years. Right, and it's not discretionary. There are some rules uh, where it's basically, you know, you answer yes or no to the question. Leadership, is leadership acting properly? I'm just getting, throwing out general potential questions, okay, not the actual question, since that is proprietary. But it is basically, you know, uh, a binary system in terms of yes, no. If a certain number of things add up and lead in a certain direction, then, we, then the model shifts. But it is... We do try, or Dr. K does try to keep it objective and based on some objectively observable phenomenon in the market. So you don't want to be trying to finesse things or getting scared or getting excited. You have a couple of updates when you're on a sell signal and we do get some emails, people want us to shift to a buy, which 
that would be a weird indicator to use. How many people email you telling you to ship to a buy determines whether we would ship to a buy. We should try that one. Test back test that one, will you, Dr. Pam? Like a, that would be maybe a contrarian sig signal if enough people thought Could be. That. A lot of times it is. So so right now we're on a buy signal, and you can go onto the website and, and see it. I'm not sure exactly where that where that is, but uh, you can explore there. You'll get to know the website better. I'm watching silver trading up on the SLV 38.73 now, so it's starting to pump back up. Uh, to the upside. Some of these other stocks, so, you know, the LinkedIn you should be out of, the FIO, FIO, I'd be out of. Uh, I'm watching ARUN, I think is a short here. I'd look for any bounce up in the 26.55. Uh, miners come up, and I just want to go over this. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, I think I will answer one question here because this is going to, how do you figure out a stop if you're not watching SLV or GLD? Well, there's a lot of ways to do this, but I would use the example of the portfolio simulator and the follow the stock service, okay? And we sent out an email from that service earlier today. And last week, I think it was, oh, uh, well, what day? It was on the pocket. On this day here, the portfolio simulator dude, who has a day job, by the way, uh, he's buying at 36.71, so he buys here. So what he's doing, I, I've already outlined what he's using. So he took a 25% position in the SLB here. He has a stop loss order with his premium broker, Churnum and Berna and Company. Those are the lawyers, probably. He's going to sell half of his position if it breaks 36.71, his original entry point. But he's going to use the 50 day moving average for the second half. So you know, you're really talking like 10, 50 percent. So the percentage amounts, he'll break even at 36.71 on the first half, but he gets blown out at 35.32, and he's going to lose, you know, 5 percent on a 12.5 percent position, which is not even 1 percent. So his his risk is well scaled here, I think, and it's a very practical way to look at it. But there is no one size fits all. There is no magic stop out that's going to prevent you from getting shaken out. This is just how the portfolio simulator dude is handling it in real time, and he puts in stop loss orders with his broker, Churnum and Burnham and Company, and just leaves it alone. And that's it. And he, so he's given himself the opportunity to be right if it launches to the upside, which is what our thesis is. So we're we're operating on that basis. We're giving ourselves some room to be right. Well, controlling risk. So what's his net risk? Well, if he sells out half at thirty six hundred zero, so like I said, it's just under one percent. So that's his controlled risk. If things really get out of hand, he gets stopped out at a price that's you know a few cents, twenty or thirty, forty cents below his stop loss order because it, you know that's just going to trigger the order and you can actually get filled lower. Then maybe he's looking at two, three percent. He can handle that because he's trading with money that he can afford to lose. Okay, it's pretty simple. You guys thought investing was hard. Everybody wants to make it hard too, but you know I'd have to say a lot of these. So. Quote systems and other analytics systems, they want to give you all these indicators. And it's often it's not that hard. But I was commenting, commenting to Dr. K last week when we started to move into the SLV on this day, because on the same day the GLD was breaking out here. So we're buying right here, and all our alerts go off boom, boom, boom on my screen, and they make sounds. Some of them are just simple bells, some of them are disgusting sounds, whatever, some custom sounds. So I always like to play the Burl Ives uh, song, Silver and Gold, from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And you can go back and look at my report, I believe, of, uh, I think it was last uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, I forget. Maybe it was last Wednesday. Let me see. We're Wednesday, Friday, whatever. No, it was last Tuesday. So uh, that's really, you know, what it is. You just coming in, you see the break that you buy it. And uh, as I comment to Dr. K, it's like, this is real easy. All our alerts on the buy side go off for silver and gold. So we start buying. We take our initial positions. It's already worked out what we're going to do, how we're going to pyramid. And what I've noticed is that the times that you really make money is when it all seems to flow very easily. When you're struggling, you buy a stock that breaks out and it doesn't go anywhere, or it starts moving higher and it jerks back around and screws you around. It, a lot of times it just tells you you're in a choppy environment. I feel that's kind of the situation with individual stocks. You play an earnings roulette on a stock-by-stock -stock basis during earnings season, which is going to continue for the next couple of weeks. Silver and gold don't have to worry about earnings. So, you know, to me, that's the easiest trade out there right now. 
If the budget ceiling is raised, more money printing, that's what it implies, goes higher. If you have issues in Europe or in the U.S. and defaults and this and that, yeah, they go higher. They're a safety trade. So I think you have its double uh, hedge with the uh, silver and the gold. Now, the only, the only caveat I would have with respect to SLV and uh, GLD is that if the market got into a protracted bear period, similar to what we have, let's just go back. If you look at the breakdown in the metals, well, let's look at the GLD better. Uh, if you get into a protracted bear period, you know what? Let's use a uh, let's use a weekly chart on the GLD. That'll be easier to show. You know, when the market gets in trouble, such as it did, uh, you know, 2008 when it broke down. It's going to come down. It'll start to get hit. So that's why we would stick to our stops. But that's the only downside, I think, for silver and gold is that if the market starts to really get nailed and you have a liquidity crisis, then gold and silver become sources of liquidity as well. So people will sell their SLB, their GLD, and freak out and get out. So that would probably trigger some stops. But you kind of have to watch what the general market is doing. I think at that point, if you got into a protracted bear, where you start to see some sort of failure like you're seeing here on the weekly chart of the GLD here, uh, then you know here's a break below the 50-day moving average. That would probably would have got you out of here. So it's starting to violate in here. It could have been any of these days during this week, these two weeks. So that would get you out. But that's you can see that if that happens, you're going to be forced out by following your stops. So, uh, But that's really the only scenario where I see uh, gold and silver being derailed. I don't really think sentiment is all that. Uh, bullish right now. I'll know when I have uh, friends calling me asking me if it's time they should buy silver. Similar to what they were doing in the, the end of April. Uh, so that's pretty much that. Uh, we don't really have any questions on individual stocks. If anybody wants to throw anything out, we've got three minutes. But as far as we're concerned, stocks are not the thing to be playing here. Silver and gold is the cleanest trend. If you're playing the indexes on the, the buy signal on the model, you're going to buy, and so far it's working slightly. So, all right, there's a lucky winner here. GSM uh, asking us what we think about it. Uh, now, I, I would have to say you should be able to figure this one out on your, your own because you have a pocket pivot here. It's holding the 10-day. So uh, do we have a crystal ball telling you it's about to break the 10-day or go higher? No. All you know for sure is you got a pocket pivot. It's holding the pocket pivot. End of story. Um, somebody's asking, uh, IBD switch to market and uptrend. Yeah, they're going to do that, and that makes sense. I don't, I don't see any problem with it. Uh, but they'll be back and forth. But again, they're trying to be reasonably objective, uh, I think. But they're not going to be. You know, some people want to fault them for switching back and forth. Well, they're just going by what they see, and they're making the call. It doesn't mean they do tell you to be careful because it is a funky environment. You are in the, the third year of a bull market off the lows of 2009, so you can be volatile and you can get choppy. So a couple of quick names. MCP is just trying to build the bottom of a base. We're not buyers. Potash, uh, he had a gap up yesterday. It's like a pocket pivot, gap up. It's up there. Oh, are we going to buy it? Eh. We like silver and gold. I mean, it could be moving up on the same premise. Um, ISRG. I should get to the miners too. A uh, nice move up, but we're not going to buy that either. A nice big gap up on earnings. So earnings roulette winner there. Riverbed earnings roulette loser. So you know, however you want to play it, it's all great in hindsight, but it's hard to figure it out. Um, going in. Uh, you could use, I guess, you could use the CEF, the Central Fund of Canada, uh, as an alternative to silver. I, I guess that would work. I suppose it looks uh, that, that mainly invests in silver. I think they have some gold. It's in a vault in Canada. I suppose it's real. Uh, I've heard a lot it's of. Actually, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty. Um, it looks like gold is 52% uh, and silver is 46%. So it's more yeah. heavily weighted toward gold. Yeah, and so with, you know you have AG. Uh, it's probably building a handle here. You, you notice you're up 12 out of 15 days in a row or better, but you're looking to build a handle in here. I like Coeur d'Alene, too. They're pretty well leveraged to the price of silver, uh, and it's acting okay. You had a pocket pivot. It's lower in its pattern, though, so really AG is your strongest one. Also, as far as uh, gold miners go, Royal Gold is a breakout. But, you know, if you look at it, it's kind of just tracking GLD, so you can just own GLD. 
the miners are funky. They they sometimes track well, sometimes they don't. They don't hold up as well when everything breaks down. So I prefer to play uh, silver and gold myself. You know, if you like AG and you think it's exciting uh, because it's got a cool name, first objective majestic silver, and it was a recent IPO or recently started trading on the NYC back. Uh, well, I guess the last man was, and had a big move, climactic move here, here actually. Here, wait, where was that? Here it was, yeah, there it is. I knew it was in here somewhere. Kind of climactic move. You see the amp there, shows up, and then you correct, and now you're probably building a handle. I, I like this story. I think it's one of the better silver plays, but you know, if you want the juice of the stock, and just buy the AGQ and track it to the SLV. So there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat here. We prefer to keep it simple. We like the SLV, and we like the AG, uh, AGQ. Uh, something that say. Uh, Dr. K has music to have his trading balance. How about you, Gil? What do you do for fun? Well, I play guitar, and I've been playing guitar since I was 16, and I've played in several bands that I continue to play, probably, probably every day. When Dr. K's in town, sometimes we jam together. But mostly I like to go up to uh, Beverly Hills and visit Dr. K's dad, Del Kesher, and play guitar get a lesson from him. Sometimes I even get a lesson from him over the phone, but he's the only guy I've ever... Uh, had as my teacher, but I'm definitely very passionate about uh, the guitar and playing the guitar. It's a great release. Uh, sometimes you have a bad day in the market and you might feel a little bit frustrated, and it happens. You know, I feel frustrated. I'm human, even though I avoid bringing emotion into my trading. I do get frustrated, and there's nothing better than pulling out one of my 30 electric guitars and uh, hooking it up to my big Marshall stack and turning it up to full blast and just trying to break the windows in the house. That works very well for me, so I enjoy that. Uh, I also am an avid chess player. I'm a Class B rated player with the United States Chess Federation. Last tournament I played in was two years ago. It was a five-round Swiss tournament, uh, and in my class, I won the tournament. So I won forty-eight dollars, and that's I got to tell you that was some of, probably the most satisfying forty-eight dollars I've ever won in my life. Uh, what else? I like to grow chili peppers, and I have a prolific garden of chilies going right now, and I make my own salsa. Uh, and I have two kids, and anybody who has kids will tell you that's enough of a diversion to keep your mind off of just about anything except raising your kids. So, so you know, Dr. K is into a lot of other things, too, you know. Uh, so I would say we're pretty well-rounded, and the two of us together make a big round figure eight, I guess. Uh, anyways... That's really all the time we have. Mobius, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Pardon me, Dr. K? A Mobius strip. Yeah, we're a Mobius strip of diversity. But, you know, we, there's other things besides the market. And uh, you got to take some time off, I think at least every day, uh, and balance it off. And we're fortunate in the fact that we don't really have to be in an office, so we can work from the home office. And that allows me to be around my kids all day and show them what's going on. So, yeah, so we try to stay balanced. but. Uh, I, I don't know if that necessarily means you have to. I know that Bill O'Neill was pretty much all market all the time. I know that he liked baseball and he liked lifting weights, but the market was pretty much it for him, and uh, and he did very well. So I really think it depends on what you need. And again, you know, know thyself, and that goes for whether you think you need time off to recharge or to get your mind off the market because you get too wrapped up in it, as well as whether you're investing an amount of money that you can afford to lose. Because if you can't, like we said, that's been the theme of today's webinar. If you can't afford to lose what you're trading with, then you're not going to be able to trade it. So, anyways, and it's also, it's also it. important to not fall into the trap of uh, some su successful investors like Victor Sperandeo, who I have immense respect for, and he's published some excellent books that I highly recommend. But he talks about how he became estranged from his daughter as she was growing up because he was so overly focused on the markets and making a lot of money and he realized at the end of it that uh, you know there's more to life than than career success and, and making a lot of money so it, you know the key I think really is finding one's balance uh, in all pursuits um, and that I think creates a very contented uh, happy existence definitely so, so anyway so we're happy guys we're having fun anyways that's all we got for now I think the message is pretty clear you guys know what, how to operate in this market uh, stocks are tough, but we love silver and gold. The Burl Ives investment strategy rules the day. So on that note, everybody, thanks for listening. Uh, we'll catch you the next time, and uh, good luck today. Take care. Take care, everybody.